Number 10, hold the mustard, please. World War I cannot be talked about without talking about the crazy advancements in technology. Seemingly, nations and empires were just itching to try them out on each other. Airplanes, tanks, blimps, machine guns, mostly fairly new and extremely lethal. However, the life of a World War I soldier cannot be talked about without talking about mustard gas or chemical weapons. In 1907, major world players agreed to ban chemical weapons from warfare. So you can understand the confusion by Allied soldiers on the Second Battle of Ypres when over 150 tons of chlorine gas were released. A terrible weapon that would cause trouble breathing, burns, and vomiting. It was so effective that the Allies immediately began working on their own chemical weapons and gas masks to prevent the effects of this super villain level weapon. I think this quote by World War II General MacArthur sums it up. Whoever said the pen is mightier than the sword obviously never encountered automatic weapons. He's not wrong. He's not wrong. Number 9. All quiet on the western front. This is kind of obvious, but people die in war. In World War I, a lot of people died. And a lot of these young men and comrades in arms formed bonds with one another only to have those friends and brothers be killed and taken away from each other. Over two million German soldiers would perish in the First World War, which later would have all kinds of disastrous effects on the country, especially with the rise of evil mustache man. France also lost a similar amount of men. Trench warfare was brutal, and I'll get to that shortly. One of my favorite books and movies, actually, All Quiet on the Western Front, depicts a group of young German boys who are in this thing together all while having a strong anti-war message or at least questioning the legitimacy of the First World War. Just make sure when you're in the trenches, no one's handing you those fresh new boots. It's an omen. Number eight, one star review. It may come as a surprise to some of you, but living in the trenches on the Western Front wasn't a super fun time. We don't recommend it here at Bumblebee. If you're like me, then you love a good hearty meal. Like my mom always said, I'm a meat and potato kind of guy. That's just how it goes. A nice grilled rare steak, roasted garlic potatoes, and a freshly tossed crisp lettuce Caesar salad. Ooh, that sounds amazing. I'm kind of hungry now. And maybe a beer or two to wash it down. Just a classic meal for a classic guy that I really enjoy. Sadly for the boys in the trenches, this could not have been further from reality. Anyone in the military today with our modern technology will tell you how delicious MRE rations are. But for soldiers of the First World War, rations were limited. And as time went on, especially on the German side, where in 1918 rations were whittled down to turnip soup and turnip bread. Ugh. There were still beer rations. However, and if I'm gonna be shot at, I still want a little ale to cure what ails me. You know what I'm saying? Go a long way. Number seven, trench living. I know after a long day of work, most folks like to kick back and relax. A nice warm house, a cold beer, maybe the game's on. You come home to a family that loves you. The life of a soldier in World War I was more of the horrific variety. Basically, you live in a deep hole that stretches for miles and interconnects with tunnels and other trenches. It's freezing cold in the winter, blistering hot in the summer. Rains right on top of you and the mud. Oh, the mud is an issue. Bogged down in a muddy hole, wet freezing with other miserable men who are also wet and freezing. Just not a fun time for anyone involved. I love winter and a good rainstorm here and there, but the difference is I get to come out of the cold after a long day making snow angels or jumping in puddles. The impending doom and being soaking wet would damper anyone's mood. Number six, disease in a time of plague. While living in a trench for long periods of time may suck, there's other things besides spooky spiked helmeted Germans waiting to kill you. Bullets, bombs, and artillery are lethal, but you had a very high chance of dying from disease. A lot of these trenches became isolated from supply lines for multiple reasons, and sometimes could be a logistical nightmare, meaning supplies were oftentimes difficult to come by. But no amount of supply could fix the disgusting living conditions of the trenches. Soldiers claimed by the war would often just rot, as recovering fallen comrades was made difficult in trench warfare, making diseases very easy to catch. Besides influenza and typhoid, the most common sickness would be trench foot, or gangrene, where really the only thing to treat it is a trip to the medic's hut with a saw blade to amputate your foot, in which is a pain I cannot even begin to imagine. No thank you. You ever seen 127 hours? It's kind of the same thing. Number five, of rats and men. The trenches were a messed up place to be for a human being. Seriously, I, I can't recommend it to anyone. 
but for a small rodent creature like a rat, it may as well be Caesar's Palace Las Vegas. As a rat, you had access to food scraps, shelter, and everything a growing rat needs. They breed like crazy and have become commonplace amongst the soldiers and decaying bodies sinking in the hellish mud. The rats grew bigger and bolder with some cases of rats stealing food right out of soldiers' hands. Sometimes there was so many that soldiers had to essentially hunt them in order to call the numbers, as there was no system for removing them entirely. On a brighter note though, some soldiers kept them as pets to keep their minds off the impending doom of World War I and trench combat. So you know what, that's, that's kind of cool, little rat friend. I'll call him Ralph, I don't know why, Ralph's cool name. Number four, No Man's Land. This is what all the chaos is about. The part most soldiers quivering in their boots fear. Maybe it's better to stay with the rats and corpses and freeze. Most soldiers are waiting for one sound. That means two things. A whistle blowing means you're going over the top or the enemy is coming to you. Either way, someone is going to have to cross no man's land, which is the space between two opposing trenches defended on either side with barbed wire, mines, and machine guns, waiting to cut down the enemy charging at full speed. No man's land earns its grim nickname as the bodies that fall out there will stay there and become a part of the battlefield. Rolling artillery barrages were meant to aid soldiers in crossing no man's land, but no amount of help, liquid courage, or any other factor could really prepare you for that first leap of faith, climbing over the top and facing the enemy. Number three, humanity. While a lot of soldiers met their demise to the new inventions of the war, like chemical weapons and improved artillery, trench warfare brought out the worst in humanity. The idea of going over the top was to take the enemy trench. Doing so would move the front line up. A war of inches, if you will. However, you cannot take the enemy trench if the enemy is still there. And that is where the bayonets come in. Swords, knives, rifles in close range, clubs, mallets, and homemade blunt objects, and sometimes fists, were used in an intimate setting of a muddy trench just to kill each other. Often being some of the most brutal and intense fighting of the war. Even after all that, taking the trench was difficult, but defending it was more, as oftentimes armies went back and forth trying to break enemy lines in between trenches. No thanks. Number two, sharks with frickin' laser beams. Okay, I know the title's a little misleading, but hear me out. Airplanes and aviation had only been invented a few years prior, or at least a modernized version of them. So humans gained the ability to fly, something people of the past could only dream of. So what's the first thing humans do to this amazing revolutionary invention? Can we weaponize this? Yeah, it's kind of messed up to think about, but when we gained the ability to fly, one of the first real uses we used it for was to destroy each other. Airplanes did play a crucial role in World War I, but not just for ace pilots like the Red Baron, but for reconnaissance. At least the tank was designed for military application. Leave it up to us to strap an automatic weapon and bombs to one of the greatest gifts ever given to mankind. And the sharks with frickin' laser beams attached to their frickin' heads are the same energy. I, I think so, at least. Number one, Merry Christmas. This would honestly confuse me if I was a soldier in World War I. It would make me question a lot of things. Things like why am I here freezing and dying and shooting at people I don't really have an issue with. The Christmas truce of 1914 was a truce by the Entente and the Central Powers, more specifically on the Western Front, who climbed out of their trenches to shake hands and share a moment of peace on Christmas. The soldiers, for the most part, got along swimmingly. What's messed up is a few days later, they were back at it again with blowing up and destroying each other. Personally, I don't know how you could do that after sharing a beer with somebody. It just doesn't make any sense. Kicking off the list at number 10, a day in the life. So as soon as the sun came up, your life as a Civil War soldier began. You would train day in, day out, preparing for battle. It was important that each soldier knew their role to work together as a unit. Now, I would say that there's no time for fun and games, but they always made time to blow some steam off. In between drills, soldiers would do chores just like we do every day. They would cook meals, do laundry, clean gear, and make sure that everything is smooth. Passing the time was done by playing dominoes or poker. Reading was of course a popular way of passing the time as well, but it was a lot harder to get your hands on a book back then, especially when you're running around between marches and battles. So more often than not, soldiers would trade newspapers with their opponents. You would hear about the Christmas peace treaty, but this would happen as well, they would just trade papers. A soldier named Milton Barrett, stationed in the 18th Georgia Volunteers, wrote about this back in 1863. He said, Our regiment had just come off picket. We stood close together and could talk to each other. Then when the officers were not present, we exchanged papers and bartered tobacco for coffee. They would do it when the officers weren't looking. That's the most intriguing part. They would manage this by using a small boat. Tricky, always away. The first aerial photograph was back in 1860. James Wallace Black took this photo, not by using drones or any bowling alley crazy technology we have today, but rather just a hot air balloon. 
This lovely landscape is the town of Boston and you're looking at it from 2,000 feet. This was a long time before selfie sticks. Even longer before that, hot air balloons were being used in warfare. The first account of a hot air balloon being used in war was 1794, when the French Committee of Public Safety created the Corps de Astrociers, which is a hot air balloon squad. They were used in the Battle of Charleroi and Fleurus, and then 70 years later, they were used in the American Civil War. They were pretty large as well, they could fit around five guys, where smaller balloons like the Eagle and Excelsior only carried one soldier. Those were for stealth flights. That'd be pretty brave. Imagine seeing a hot air balloon coming over the horizon and it has soldiers shooting at you. That's incredible. I, I didn't hear about any of this growing up. They could reach up to a thousand feet, so they definitely had a vantage point like no other, and they would communicate with soldiers on the ground using flag signals or, of course, telegraphs. The most successful balloon program in the Union was under the command of Thaddeus Lowe. He and Lincoln were allies, and Lowe actually sent a telegraph to Lincoln once describing the view of Washington from above. Call your friends more and describe your view to them. You might get a few things done. Number eight, bounty jumpers. Fewer than 150 Union soldiers were killed for desertion, and Lincoln was actually constantly writing letters and endorsements reducing soldier sentences from death to labor during the war. That's how bad it got. Deserters were a big problem for both the Confederate and Union armies, so it was punishable by death. After the Battle of Fredericksburg, the Union had 100 deserters roughly a day. That's a lot, every single day. The Union actually used peer pressure at one point just to keep soldiers from leaving. In 1863, the Union offered regiment perks if a certain percentage of original men were on for a following tour of duty. So soldiers inside were making others stay on board. How they did that, what they said, we don't know. Bounty jumpers were men who were paid to fill on the spot of newly drafted soldiers. So these guys would join for a few days and then desert them all over again and join a new post as the new substitute and get paid. Of course, some deserters were branded to avoid this problem. Number seven, daily diet. These soldiers were all around 25 years old. The minimum age to join, of course, was 18, but a lot of these guys who were that young would often lie about their age anyways on paper. So on paper, the average was 25 years. But these guys were kids, basically. They ate mostly crackers. And when I say crackers, I don't mean the salty work snacks that you have today. These were made of like flour and water and just salt called hardtack. They would eat berries, nuts, and fruits, anything they could find is all they had. Most of these soldiers were close to starving to death. Number six, soldiers protest. One third of the Union soldiers were immigrants, and one in 10 were African American. And those soldiers actually refused their salaries for 18 months to protest being paid lower wages than white soldiers. When black soldiers were signing up in the Union Army in 1863, they were only getting $10 a month, while white soldiers were getting around $13 a month. Officers were getting $700 a month too. It was just insane. To make things even worse, black soldiers were then hit with a $3 monthly cleaning fee, bringing that down to $7 a month now. So a protest was in order and it was held for 18 months, and then come September 1864, black soldiers received equal pay that was retroactive to their enlistment date. So they finally were able to send money back to their families after that long. Number five, passing time. You would assume the Civil War and being part of it and everything I've talked about would give you enough anxiety, but gambling was also a common pastime in between battles. And when I say gambling, I don't mean, okay, it's nighttime, let's throw a few bucks down and play dominoes. No, they would gamble on everything. Horse races, chess, euchre, poker, checkers, cards were popular until the end of the Civil War when, of course, they were harder to come by, being so flimsy and all. And when dominoes and cards were out of the picture, soldiers would really go old school and play leapfrog. Yeah, games like that were literally all they had. They would wrestle each other for fun, they would have foot races and bet on them. Bowling would be played using cannonballs to knock down wooden pins. And baseball was also played, but it was a little different back then to how we remember it now. The ball was a lot softer and there was sometimes only two bases. The only way you were out also was if you were hit by the ball, hence the softness that I mentioned. Number four, coldest winters. With the winter winds rolling in occasionally, soldiers could no longer play baseball outside and peg each other with baseballs. But what you could do was hit each other with snowballs. A little fun, also a little scary. They called it a snow battle. Yeah, a snow battle too. Battle, way more intense. Soldiers would leave with bruises, black eyes, and sometimes even broken bones. Yeah, these guys were blowing off lots of steam and they would plan attacks and take it obviously seriously, as they did with their daily civil duties. Even officers got in on this action. When pieces of ice were no longer available to large units to throw at one's head, other winter games would include skating and sledding. Number three. 
Food March. In April 1863, a group of mostly women led a march to get the governor's attention. The governor at the time, John Letcher, was joined by President Jefferson Davis. It did not end well. The food situation in the South was not great because food prices changed depending on the status of the war. Outcomes of the battle directly affected prices because they were linked to the CSA's currency. That plus the fact that invading troops from the North would often burn crops when they came through, it was getting worse over time. Come April 1863, this march of women broke windows. They flipped carts until eventually they drew out Governor John Letcher and President Jefferson Davis. John Letcher literally started to throw cash at the protesters. Now they still didn't stop, obviously, that didn't solve problems. It was so bad that the militia almost had to open fire. Number two, the alligator. I mentioned soldiers and hot air balloons, so I must mention the United States Navy's first submarine. How fun. This 47 foot long submarine that was paddle powered, yep, you heard me, paddle powered, so you'd be inside and just, you would do this. We can't call it the USS Alligator because they technically didn't see any active days of combat. In fact, the Alligator, that's what I'll call it, had to be cut loose on its first mission. It was being towed behind the USS Sumter on April 2nd, 1863, right off North Carolina when bad weather hit. The Alligator went down and we haven't found it since. It's still out there. The Alligator is still lurking out there. Only a few months after this new weapon went down, the Confederate States of America launched their own sub, the H.L. Huntley, and it sank the USS Housatonic near the coast of Charleston, officially marking the first time a submarine sank an enemy ship. It also immediately sank afterwards, taking the lives of eight crewmen, so even in victory, you're not safe. They made history, but only enjoyed it for minutes. This is all tragic. Number one the wage gap. Hundreds of women joined the Civil War and they did so by looking like men. Yeah, they would pull a she's the man and get to work. But the thing is, like I mentioned before, with the CSA's currency being affected by the status of the war, soldiers were getting $13 a month roughly. That's double what a woman could make anywhere on the planet, so they really had no choice but to join. This was long before women's suffrage, so if they thought you were a man, you could use that $13 how you wanted. So it comes to no surprise that women would keep this disguise even after the war ended. In 1909, the US Army officially denied that any woman was ever enlisted in the military service of the United States as a member of any organization of the regular or volunteer army at any time during the period of the Civil War. During the Civil War though, that was the first time in American history when women all came together in a war effort. Thousands of women from the North and South volunteered as nurses. Number 10, Queen of the Red Sails. In history, when men drop the ball, there's always an iron-willed woman to pick up the slack. Not because a man is telling her to, but because she wants to. How about inheriting a whole pirate fleet from your late husband? Meet Zhang Yi Sao. Her husband had managed to build quite the little nautical empire, and with his untimely passing, she became the boss. She commanded a fleet of over 400 ships, and estimated between 20 to 60,000 pirates at her peak. She's noted for organizing and uniting pirates into a confederation. She also had some imperial entanglements, having entered conflict with the East India Company and the Portuguese Empire. This is a lot to go through, especially when I get anxiety from being left alone at the cashier at the grocery store. Number nine, double trouble. The Trung sisters from Vietnam are still celebrated today because honey, they went through a lot. The sisters led the first resistance against Chinese dominance, which at the time had lasted over 247 years. Many believe Vietnam wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for their efforts, gathering 80,000 people to join their cause, once killing a tiger and writing a proclamation of war on its hide. They managed to hold off the Chinese forces for three years before finally being overtaken. The Trung sisters are a great deal of national pride and pride amongst many women in Vietnam. Sadly, the Chinese proved too strong. But to prevent capture, the sisters later drowned in a last fit of defiance. Number 8. Hell Hath No Fury The Roman Empire was just about good at everything. Politics, culture, building a city that would stand the test of time and eventually outlive their civilization. But perhaps the Romans' strongest attribute was their military. I mean, come on, it's Rome. No introduction is needed here. So when a man was worried that the Romans he had worked with might take over his homeland after he had passed, he left a note in his will saying, please do not take this. This is mine, don't take it. I'll give the folks at home a second to think about what the Romans did next. If you guessed annex his homeland and do non-YouTube friendly conduct things to his wife and daughter, you'd be correct. His wife, Boudicca, not feeling so cool about what happened, took some action by gathering the tribe together and revolting against the Romans. Defeating the scrambled Romans in a battle, she then made her way to Londinium, or what's now London, 
and had it burned. There were empires that couldn't take down the Roman Empire, and Boudicca did it like it was nothing. They did end up losing, and once again, to avoid capture, drank poison. But come on, she took down the Romans. Number seven, Viva la Revolution. Juana de Padilla was born in Spanish controlled Peru to two loving parents. Like many classic stories, her mother sadly passed away when she was young where she grew very attached to her father. Although unusual for the time, her father instructed her on how to horse ride and sharpshoot. Even helped her father work during the days. They were pretty tight, but like an M. Night Shyamalan movie, there's a double twist. Her father passed away in her teens. Now an orphan, she was forced to move in with her aunt, where she quite possibly developed the very first feelings of teenage angst before there was ever an Avril Lavigne album. Juana would often have outbursts that got her eventually sent to become a nun where that also did not go very well. During her studies, she was fond of Joan of Arc, but eventually she was expelled at a young age of 17. After years of witnessing colonial reign, she joined the revolution. She became so passionate about the cause, she once fought a battle while pregnant, went back to have a baby, and then went back to battle with the baby strapped to her back. Man, sometimes I don't even want to get up after a large meal. What a woman. Number six, not one step back. Ludmila Pavlchenko was just like any other girl in Russia in the 1940s. She was in her last year of university when history's favorite mustache man invaded history's second favorite mustache man. Feeling inspired by her country's call to arms, she signed up for military service. She would eventually find her way to be a sharpshooter. During the siege of Odessa, she is credited with 187 confirmed kills. She married a fellow sniper, he died, then she went on to have over 300 confirmed kills when the war was over. Once the military realized how valuable she was, she was pulled from the front lines, where she became key propaganda for Russia. She would also find herself training young snipers up until the end of the war. She was oftentimes referred to as the Lady of Death. Number 5. The Limping Lady World War II was the cause and effect for a lot of things. If you like spies and espionage, it's kind of where it all started. One of the best spies who did more than her fair share was Virginia Hall, a lady with a peg leg who thwarted German plans again and again. With her sidekick and peg leg nicknamed Cuthbert, she was credited by top German officials as being the most dangerous spy of all time. In one OSS report, her team is credited with destroying four bridges, derailing a freight train, and neutralizing 150 enemies with hundreds more captured. Now, I'm not a world-class detective or anything, but I feel like if you're trying to find the female spy with a peg leg, it isn't that hard on account of, you know, some pretty specific identifying features. I don't know how you messed that up. Where is the lady? Where is her? And you like hear her walking down the hall. She got a peg leg. What do you mean? Number four, Miss General. Fu Hao was one of 60 wives to Emperor Wu Ding, which I'm not sure even Mormons can figure that out. But to avoid obscuring him to the background like TV's least favorite sister wife, she took control. According to records, she led many successful military campaigns and commanded an army of 13,000. While stories of the past can get lost, this is most likely true as her tomb was full of many different weapons like great axes, which was common to bury distinguished generals with at the time. When I'm buried as a warrior princess, I want my collection of pop figures to come with me. I spent too much time on those bad boys to not take them with me to the afterlife. Number three, fatality. Tamiris was the queen of Mazagate, or at least I think that's how it's pronounced, a confederation of nomadic tribes that lived east of the Caspian Sea. She ruled during the 6th century BC and is most famous for her vengeful war she waged against the Persian king Cyrus the Great. At first, the war wasn't going too great. Unfortunately, her son claimed his life out of shame for losing in battle. Mom was not happy and promised the bloodiest battle ever. Well, she wasn't lying. As the promised battle was very bloody, many Persians perished in battle, including Cyrus. When his body was recovered, the vengeful queen harnessed the power of mid-90s fighting games and removed his head and turned his skull into a cup and proclaimed, drink your fill of blood. Nice. Number two, the beautiful samurai. What does it mean to be a samurai? Armor, a kick-ass sword, and a coat of honor? Yes, it does. And Tomoe Gozen did it all and had time to look good doing it. Tomoe Gozen's life is shrouded in mystery and many debate her existence, but whatever be the case, she did leave a mark on history, a very red stain mark on history. Earning the respect of the men around her, it was stated that she had long black hair and a 
fair complexion and was in command of a large number of men. However, her biggest claim to fame, when she was approached by multiple foes, she rode right at them, grabbing their leader and liberating his head from his shoulders. Wow, you slay it, queen. Number one, who else could it go to but the Maid of Orleans? All the badass women who went through a lot on this list, they seen some stuff, honey. But Joan, Joan of Arc, girl, she takes the cake. Joan was born a poor peasant, but had a unique gift. She could speak to the gods, and the gods told her it was her time to shine. By the time she was 19, she had led thousands of men to battle and in glorious victory. Charles VII, losing the 100 Years War at the time, said, All right, sure, send the girl to fight. What have we got to lose? Well, they actually had a lot to win. Once Joan had gotten involved, the French began to win victory after victory, and her claims of being guided by God didn't seem so far-fetched after all. The British, being so shaken up by the young girl's military prowess, thought she had been possessed by the devil. The British, not liking losing war to a teenage girl, decided to treat her with compassion by keeping her warm with a fire while she was tied to a wooden post. Joan would later become a legend for her efforts because getting burned at the stake is honestly a lot and I can't even deal. 